13 billion years ago, expansion started way more. The earth began to cool, the autotrophs began to drool, Neanderthals developed tools, we built a wall. We built the pyramids, math, science, history, unraveling. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here um, in, in Stockholm. I um, actually used to live here as a kid uh, from age 9 to 12. I have, have a lot of great memories. Um, but I'm based now in California, in Silicon Valley, in uh, Palo Alto, and um, started a company three years ago called Jaunt. And I'm happy to tell you a little bit about Jaunt and also about um, kind of VR in general, and specifically about cinematic VR, which, which I think you'll find especially interesting. Um, so, at Jaunt, we're very much focused on essentially uh, what we call uh, premium VR, premium cinematic VR. Um, and uh, some of the things we do involve music, involve um, uh, film, uh, news, etc. We'll, we'll cover a few of these things. Uh, what you see up there is a slide, an example of one of the first pieces we did with uh, Paul McCartney who did uh, the last concert at Candlestick Park in San Francisco, and we were able to record that uh, in VR. So you see next to his piano is uh, actually our f one of our first cameras, prototype cameras, next to the piano. And uh, that created a really fantastic uh, experience in that you feel like you're actually up there with Paul on stage. Um, so one important thing about uh, VR in general is it can place you places you might not otherwise be able to go. Uh, so, for example, in music, uh, we call it the ticket that you can't buy. Uh, you, you know, you, you can buy a ticket to even be on the front row at a concert, but you can't buy a ticket to be up on stage. And VR gives you th that opportunity. It also gives you the opportunity to be somebody else. Uh, so, when, when you put on a pair of headsets, you essentially become the camera and where the camera is. And it gives you a sense of perspective that you never get when you have uh, essentially a screen in front of you. Um, so, you, you know, in terms of Jaunt, uh, we were started uh, about three years ago. Uh, we're based in Palo Alto. We also have a studio in uh, Los Angeles. And we've raised about $100 million uh, from companies like um, Disney and Google. Um, uh, in Europe, uh, Sky is an investor, uh, Axel Springer, uh, ProSieben. Um, and, um, you know, our mission is really to deliver high quality premium VR. Um, so, you know, one thing about 2016 is that VR is really taking off. Uh, so, uh, it, it really started off uh, a couple of years ago when uh, Facebook bought Oculus, the, the first headset, for, for $2 billion. Uh, and that led to a lot more investment uh, in the VR area. Um, and uh, at the time, you know, what was interesting is Mark Zuckerberg said that he really views VR as the logical next platform uh, for people to connect. Uh, so you've essentially had you know, a world that started off with PC, uh, it, it went to the web, we're, we're now very much on mobile, and the idea is that over time we'll, we'll migrate to VR. Um, and uh, so there's a lot happening, there are a lot of headsets that, that are coming online. Um, in terms of the market uh, landscape, uh, there's a whole ecosystem that's being built up. There are people focusing uh, on the hardware side, you know, companies like uh, HTC and Oculus, uh, even Sony, PlayStation. Uh, there are companies, um, you know, essentially focusing on, on the software side, uh, on, on the content side. And then there's some companies that are kind of pure VR, uh, and, and the, the Jaunt is one of those companies that's focusing. We see ourselves very much as a VR media company. Uh, so when we talk about VR, there are actually different types of VR, and this is actually a very important point to understand, especially if you're uh, thinking about the web and streaming and so on. Uh, so first of all, you know, the traditional uh, VR uh, is really originated with gaming, uh, and th that's a type of VR that's uh, generated in real time. So in a game, you're actually moving around, maybe you're shooting things, and what's happening is the whole world is being created uh, in real time. Every pixel is being computed uh, at 90 frames a second. Uh, and, and, and that type of gaming VR requires a big computer to do that uh, with a big GPU. Um, you have another type of VR that's pre-rendered VR, uh, what we call cinematic VR. And that's a type of VR where you're, you capture things with, with special cameras, uh, and it actually, the, the VR experience gets created typically up in the cloud, uh, and a lot of compute power is necessary to create that VR experience. 
But once it's created, it's essentially a special video file uh, that can be streamed. And it can be streamed uh, not just to computers, obviously, it can be streamed to your mobile phone, to your smartphone. Uh, and, um, and, and then it can be viewed with portable glasses, things like Google Cardboard or Samsung Gear VR or, or things sort of in between. In addition to that, if you don't have a headset, you can also stream it as 360 video. So uh, any VR content, any cinematic VR content can be uh, essentially translated into a 360 video. And that's becoming, in the last few months, becoming very, very popular. So people are able to see essentially VR experiences first as a 360 video piece, and then they're uh, later able to uh, watch it on, um, with a headset. So uh, VR has a long history. Um, you, you know, uh, it's, uh, th this is actually a picture of uh, Christopher Walken a long time ago uh, from the movie Brainstorm uh, in the, from 1983. Uh, the, the Matrix came out in, in, in the 90s talking about alternate realities. Uh, there's uh, a movie, Ready Player One, based on a, a book that sort of predicts a dystopian future where suddenly everybody's spending all their time in VR as societies falling apart around them, uh, but it should be a pretty entertaining movie and is uh, directed by Spielberg. Um, uh, one key thing about VR is over time it's been very, very hard to do. Uh, so what you see there on the slide is a headset from the Stanford VR lab uh, that uh, I think this picture was taken five or six years ago, uh, and that headset cost $40,000. Um, so because of the, the, the expense involved and, and technical difficulties of, of creating VR, it was really limited to industrial type applications and military type applications. Uh, and that changed at the end of 2012 uh, when, uh, when the DK1 uh, came out from Oculus priced at uh, $299. It wasn't a consumer product, it was meant, meant for developers, but it really inspired developers you know, and inspired us as well to, uh, to start Jaunt. Um, and then uh, even more amazing was when Google uh, released Cardboard um, uh, in, in 2014, uh, where uh, you suddenly realized that all you really needed for VR was actually your smartphones, uh, which is, uh, when you think about it, kind of amazing. You know, here are these devices that were not designed for VR, uh, but, but yet they work. And it brings up an important point. The reason that VR is finally happening now and didn't happen 5, 10, or 15 years ago is really because of smartphone technology. It's because of the lightweight um, screens that you have, the high resolution lightweight screens. It's because of the sensors that are in the phone. That's really what's making VR possible now and why you're uh, seeing the VR revolution uh, take off here in 2016. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, VR originated with gaming, uh, which really means that for gaming applications, you typically need a tethered headset. That is a headset that's tied to a, a big computer. Uh, you typically need a controller of some kind, like in this case, he's holding a, a typical gaming controller. Uh, and uh, one challenge with uh, VR gaming is just the cost of creating uh, games is uh, typically in the tens of millions of dollars. Uh, cinematic VR, on the other hand, uh, is, uh, oh sorry, yeah, cinematic VR uh, really has a much wider appeal. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not for people who have a, uh, you know, a tethered headset and a big computer, it's really anyone with a smartphone. Uh, and, uh, you know, one key thing about it uh, is that it reaches many, you know, pretty much any demographic, young or old, male, female, etc. It's not just the gamer demographic. Um, and uh, the other key point is that this type of content is much less expensive to produce. Essentially what you need is, is a camera and you can take it around and record things. And so we will record things for, you know, in the thousands of dollars or, or tens of thousands of dollars instead of the millions. Uh, so an important point about VR is that it's really already in your pocket. You, you, you can have VR experiences with your smartphone today using things like the Gear VR, uh, the, the Mattel Viewmaster that's come out, uh, or, or Google Cardboard. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, w one interesting uh, aspect about this is really how important cinematic VR has become, even for the tethered uh, headset manufacturers. Uh, so, John Carmack, who is uh, the CTO of Oculus, you know, recently said that they're noticing that people are spending more than half the time uh, consuming media experiences in, in those headsets. Uh, and that was unexpected, and he's, you know, the creator of Doom, really, you know, an amazing yeah, you know, a gaming guy. Uh, so for, for them to, to see that, it's kind of amazing. 
So what are some of the areas that, um, that, that VR uh, really transforms? Uh, one area is music. Uh, so, um, you, you know, one of the key things about music is you can establish an emotional connection very quickly uh, with people. You know, people are, are, are fans uh, of somebody that can, you know, be up on stage, they can listen to them, can listen to a favorite song, and they can get emotionally connected. And that's important because right now there's been a lot of hype around VR. People, when they first try on the headset, you know, they go, oh, wow, this is amazing. Uh, but in order to keep them coming back and keep them excited, you need content that really uh, connects with them. And, and music is, a, is, is one such type of content. Uh, film is another area. Uh, we recently collaborated uh, through the Sundance Film Festival on a piece called Collisions, uh, which is really an amazing piece um, done by Lynette Waldworth, an Australian filmmaker, uh, following the story of Neri, uh, who lives in the outback, uh, and uh, about 50 years ago witnessed a nuclear explosion uh, back there, and it really deeply affected his life. They weren't supposed to be there, and suddenly there was a, a mushroom cloud. Uh, and kind of follow the story of what happened since then. Um, it, it's a very interesting piece, a little longer than the content that we typically do. It's a 17-minute piece. Most of our content tends to be, you know, three minutes, five minutes, maybe up to 10 minutes. Uh, but it was showed at uh, the Davos World Economic Forum and also at, at the Sundance Film Festival. We also do a lot of lighter things. We recently did a thing for Zoolander 2 in VR. That's, that's actually uh, really great uh, with Ben Stiller you know, in character. Um, sports is another uh, great area for VR. Yeah, one of the key things about uh, uh, sports and VR is when you put on your headset and you look around, you create a 3D model in your head of, of what you're seeing just like you do here. You know, you get an idea of scale and size, uh, which you never do when you're just looking at a screen. So because of that, uh, you know, if I put you down uh, in a basketball game, say, uh, and you're sitting courtside, uh, suddenly in VR you realize, wow, look how, how tall the players are, look how fast they move. You know, that's something you, you can never really tell on a screen. Uh, and uh, th that sense of perspective is very powerful and, and makes it almost ideal for sports. Uh, the other area that it's, uh, it's, it's very good on is travel. Uh, so that's uh, kind of a no-brainer. In essence, you know, we can put you at the Himalayas or at a beautiful beach or, you know, more mundanely, you, you can sort of visit the hotel you're thinking about going in VR. Uh, and being able to go there, look around, maybe look out the window, get a feeling for the size of the room uh, is, is extremely, uh, you know, valuable. And so, we, you know, we predict there's going to be a lot of VR in, in the travel industry. Um, advertising. So advertising is very interesting. We're seeing a ton of interest from uh, different brands and advertisers. Uh, so one example uh, that we did are, are some pieces that we did with the North Face, uh, where we essentially uh, took our camera and in one piece we had attached to a drone and it flew over base jumpers uh, in the desert. And they, you, you can kind of see them jumping off the cliff, uh, deploying their parachutes, and it's, it's a really cool piece. And so um, uh, what North Face is doing is actually rolling that out across the North American stores. And what you see in the slide here is a customer in Chicago having that VR experience in the store and becoming inspired uh, by the North Face brand before actually going and, and shopping the store. Um, and, uh, you, you know, that's just one, one example. And one of the things that's uh, exciting to advertisers is people uh, get really engrossed in the experience. It's so immersive uh, that often people will watch it more than once. So you're not just talking about 50% engagement or 70% engagement, you often get 200% engagement. And the reason people watch it more, more than once is typically they want to go back and see if they've actually missed something uh, in the experience. Um, uh, news. So, so news is another great area. So we're working with uh, several news organizations, Sky News, uh, ABC News, uh, they recently took our camera to uh, Syria and then to North Korea and created a, a really great VR piece where you, suddenly you feel you're you know, in front of a military parade in, in North Korea or, or down in the subway in North Korea. And th that's not a place that most people will go to. And one uh, sort of fascinating thing is ABC News took that VR experience and they created a 30-second, 360-degree uh, video of it and they shared that on Facebook. And uh, it was then reshared by uh, Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, it got, I think, 18 million views within 48 hours, the, the 360 version. 
Uh, and so I was able to reach uh, really a ton of people uh, through uh, mainly Facebook. So I, I know this conference is not about technology, but I, I, I want to sh just show you just a few slides on the technology side. Uh, so this is actually a, a picture of the drone uh, with our camera mounted beneath it. It was one of our earlier cameras. Um, this was our first camera that we built. Uh, we built this uh, the summer of uh, 2013. We were three, three guys in an office, and uh, it used off-the-shelf part and a 3D printed shell. It weighed about um, you know, 70, 70 kilos. Uh, it wasn't easy to transport. So all we could really do was record ourselves throwing a ball uh, you know, over the camera. Uh, but even that little video was so effective that we managed to get funding uh, just based on the video. We didn't need any f uh, presentation. We, we just showed potential investors the video, and, and they got very excited. Um, then we went to second generation, which was really uh, based on uh, a much lighter design. Uh, this is essentially a GoPro rig with modified gro uh, GoPros. We had to put in heat sinks. We had to have external power. We had to have much larger SD cards. Uh, but e even working with something like this turned out to be very difficult because the GoPros weren't really designed for VR. Uh, the, their sensors aren't very good. Well, I shouldn't say that, but they're, they're rather kind of small sensors. They're great for outdoors. Um, and uh, so we decided what we needed to do is build a camera from the ground up designed for VR. And so we did that. We built the, the Jaunt 1 camera. Uh, that's specifically designed for VR. It has uh, much bigger lenses, um, uh, much bigger sensors uh, than the GoPros, and much better consistency between the different uh, components. They're fully synchronized, the sensors are global shutter. So it enables a, a very high quality VR experience. Um, and with that, there's a whole workflow that goes with it, because one of the challenges in VR is up till recently has been very much a do-it-yourself type project. You go and you get some cameras, you, you try and record something, and then you get some software and you try and stitch it together, and then you try and figure out how you can actually publish it and get it to users. And so what we've, what we've done is worked on kind of an automated workflow for kind of the premium content providers. And it starts with the camera, uh, but then the next step is really the post-production, uh, which really involves you know, t taking um, uh, what you have uh, and uploading it into the cloud uh, where you really create automatically a, a, an experience from that. Uh, and uh, this is what the, uh, the production pipeline looks like. Uh, you can use our camera. Uh, you typically download it to a computer. It can even be a laptop. And then you bring it up to the cloud uh, where the VR experience gets, uh, gets computed. We also use other cameras. Uh, you know, we're not just a camera company. We're really a VR media company. So we support Nokia's new camera called the Ozo. Uh, we support GoPro rigs, as, as you've seen before. Uh, so the camera shouldn't really be the limiting factor. Uh, once you've created the VR experience, uh, with, uh, you can then download it and then you can edit it. And you can use standard tools like uh, Final Cut or Premiere. Uh, you can also do sound mixing. Uh, so uh, sound turns out to be very important in VR. Uh, and so w when you're out there recording, uh, you need a special microphone. Uh, in, in our case, we use a tetrahedral microphone that records sound uh, ambisonically. Um, but you can also, in post-production, use tools like Dolby Atmos to essentially place sound anywhere in space uh, so that when you are having the experience, the sound is coming from the, the correct location. And then once you're done with your editing, and maybe you've added some special effects or whatever, you can upload it back into the cloud, and then it gets published out to a variety of platforms, uh, to Oculus, to Gear VR, uh, to the iPhone, uh, iOS, uh, or Android as well. Uh, so, uh, the, the final piece is essentially uh, uh, the, the app that delivers this, uh, and there are a variety of ways you can deliver uh, VR today. One way is uh, in, our, in our app that's fully a VR app where you, you can get the content. Uh, you can also deliver it uh, you know, on Gear VR, there's an Oculus store. Uh, there are other ways of, of doing this as well. Uh, so, you, you know, one of the key messages I, I, I want to get across is, you know, when people think VR, they, they think of headsets that are tied to computers. And I, I very much want people to start thinking of VR as a much more mobile uh, application. Uh, it's much more accessible. There are 2 billion smartphones out there. It's going to go to 4 billion by 2020. And each of those phones uh, will, will get better and better. In fact, the next generation of phones will be designed with VR in mind, uh, un unlike the first uh, generations of phones. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, Facebook is supporting 360. They're going to start supporting VR, as is YouTube. Uh, there are activations you can do, uh, marketing activations. These are very popular. Uh, we did uh, something with the NFL for the Super Bowl, where we had about 10,000 people come through uh, our um, activation and had the experience of being in an NFL football game. Uh, which was kind of amazing. People were standing in line for uh, one hour to 90 minutes uh, to have this four-minute experience, and it, it was really a big success. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, brand, websites, etc., can host both the 360 video as well as deep link uh, into a VR app as well, and we're seeing a lot of uh, success with that. So then finally, uh, kind of to summarize, uh, the, the key thing here is that VR in 2016 is really taking off. You're seeing a ton of investment from all the big companies. Uh, we predict that uh, within a few years, uh, and definitely by 2020, the whole VR slash AR uh, ecosystem is going to you know, be in the billions of dollars in terms of market. So with that, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. Uh, the theme for WebDog and this year is customer-centric. How would you say that VR is a way of uh, putting the customer first? Well, I think it's a way of engaging with the customer in a way that you haven't been able to do that before. You know, everything the customer views in VR has been created by you. Right, so you know, no matter where they look. So they, uh, unlike you know, watching a screen where you may be distracted by other things, in VR you're not distracted by other things. You're fully connected. So I think that's probably the single most uh, powerful thing. Is it, it's it's maybe maybe the most direct way of communicating with, with a customer. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.